Talking financial organization and a professional practice does not have to be boring. Are you ready for a few money in, money out ideas? It's Susan Gunn coming directly to your head to make you think. Can you handle the truth? Because she is known for being energetic, laughs a lot, and gives honest, sometimes direct, but always practical advice. It's time now for Money In, Money Out. Conflict. Oh my goodness, there are types of conflict. We can be in conflict with ourselves, conflict with others, conflict with society as a whole. We felt that this last year, right? Conflict with nature. There are so many different conflicts that wars are made out of, the kind of conflict that pits political powers against each other. Those conflicts most often do not have mutual goals because the undesired results are what brought on the conflicts. There are literary conflicts with the antagonist being the conflict creator. Great, great authors out there right now that are doing that so amazingly and so creatively. Most books center around a conflict and its resolution, good or bad. Some conflicts don't end well. Conflict and unresolved is beyond the iron sharpening iron. It is the deep cutting of the sharpened iron, often cutting what cannot heal. Conflict can be a relationship destroyer. If left un unaddressed, conflict becomes the dinosaur in the room. Conflict can be a business destroyer too, just to let you know. Conflict is a disagreement, argument, clash of opposite views. It deflates happiness. It barricades joy from the day to day. And the longer conflict is allowed to simmer, it goes beyond the uncomfortable and has the potential to destroy which was amazing. Conflict is completely distracting to everyday life. Allow me to be honest. Having courageous conversations to resolve conflict is not a topic that I am an expert on. That's why I invited my guest to share this microphone. Like most people, I will avoid further conflict by avoiding the conflict. Most of what I just said comes out of my own personal experience. Like others, I've learned how to handle conflict from my parents. Interestingly enough, my dad was great at handling conflicts in his business, the community, and those he served. I learned those skills from him. And for some unknown reason, my mom, on the other hand, was not good about handling conflict with friends or family. Unfortunately, I learned those skills from her. This last year, practices have endured more than their fair share of conflict. It's amazing. The stress of not knowing what to do, trying to make wise decisions regarding employees, trying to make sure patients were provided for, that they were safe when they came in, that the employees were safe when they saw patients, the stress to have, this is what I heard, the stress to have money to pay the bills while they weren't earning any patient revenue. All of that was great fertilizer for conflict. That's why I have invited my friend and colleague, Catherine Itell Belt, to join us again on Money In and Money Out to talk about the courageous conversations we need to have to manage and resolve conflict in our businesses and our lives. Welcome, Catherine. Oh, Susan, thank you. What a great introduction. So good oh, to be here. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'd say I'm excited to talk about this, but being the person that's a tried to stay away from conflict i get you know there is that part of me that goes okay we're done for the day really <laughs> great to hear your voice <laughs> see you later you know mm -hmm. well i i think you describe the you know a universal um stressor uh you are exactly right in your in that great introduction um most of us avoid it uh, we most of us have a feeling about conflict that 
uh, we should avoid it. And why wouldn't we? Most of us haven't learned a constructive way to deal with it. And anything in life that we do repeatedly and it doesn't go well, of course, we would avoid it. So many of us find ourselves there. Um, and, you know, you're so also so right that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, married to a, a fairly recently retired middle school teacher. And when the first time he heard my lecture on this topic, he told me later, I wish my middle schoolers would have had to have taken this as a mandatory <laughs> class because I think we would be launching, you know, a whole different workforce in a few years. Um, Maybe that's very, why very I love different. middle school and, kids so oh, much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be. It could be. Um, but you know, if we didn't, if we didn't learn it in school, and there are some classes on it, uh, sometimes in some high schools and colleges, but for the most part, most of us didn't take a class in this. And then if we didn't learn it at home, uh, or didn't have good examples of how to do it at home, then it makes sense that we have now as business owners and managers, uh, and team leaders, we've inherited this workforce that also doesn't know, also avoids. And um, I've had lots of practice owners and managers say, I don't think I should have to teach people these skills. I mean, I just want people to come to work and be mature adults and operate at a mature level, figure out their own problems, solve their own problems, and let's get get on with the work at hand. And while I totally understand that, I think uh, what should be isn't always what is. And uh, the reality is that we've we've inherited a lot of people that don't have the skill. So it, it really is incumbent upon owners and managers to number one, learn the skill for themselves and model it. And number two, to teach it, to, to make it a mandatory skill that their team learns. I'll tell you, Susan, it stops the revolving door. Oh, that's true. Uh, managers tell me, owners tell me, gosh, if I could just do the dentistry and not have to deal with all these personal issues, I, I, we'd, we'd be a lot <laughs> further down the road. And the way you do that is by handing the work back to those people with the skills to solve it. So that's really, you know, what we're talking about. Well, how did today. you get into this? Mm -hmm. It's so interesting, Susan. I, I've always been drawn to great communication. I notice it. I notice it in movies. I notice it on, on the on news broadcasts. I notice uh, well-written communication. I've always been attracted to it. So I've been a student of it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I was naturally good at this or if I learned it through the study. But over and over and over, uh, you know, for years I was a practice, for decades, I was a practice management consultant. And um, I would deal with, a, you know, a conflict would pop up in a training session, you know, somebody would disagree with what I was presenting or what I was asking the team to implement or, uh, or a disagreement would break out between two people on the team or in a workshop I was leading or someone would challenge me when I was speaking from the stage and disagree with what I was presenting. So this conflict would show up in my work and I would just handle it. And over and over again, people would come up to me afterwards and say, how do you do that? How did you do that? What was the process? And so, you know, I think a lot of us have some natural talents that we don't really recognize the system, but there's one there. And so it got me thinking about what do I do? Like, where does my mind go first? Where does it go second? Where does it go third? And sure enough, there was a process. And so we have over the last uh, many years been refining and refining that process to put it into a teachable, replicatable form. Um, and that's, you know, what I'm, I'm anxious to share with your audience today, because, you know, Susan, I think this will definitely make work better, but it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's um, work, work definitely gets better, but I think um, life gets better in general. And I don't think it's too much to say that, that we could positively impact our world if we, if more of us were I better agree. at this skill. Yeah. So for me, it's a real call. I agree. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of alluded to this a minute ago, um, but conflict resolution and learning how to do that is something that we do refine as we get older is that by oh it is true. 
It is true, but not always in the oh. best way. Sometimes I think that what we have, uh, the system we have sort of uh, maneuvered or managed for ourselves isn't always giving us the results that we want, but it's what we know. And so we respond passive aggressively, or we respond by avoiding, or we respond, we respond by attacking and going first, you know? Um, so we all know people who fit those yeah. uh those definitions and uh and they they aren't as productive as they could be though sometimes you know it's the way that we survive uh through so i guess the first you know, characteristic yeah. that we would have to to do in order to learn how to handle the conflict resolutions or learn to resolve that is to be willing to look at ourselves first because if you weren't we would and i would say uh it is that and it is also i would say the very first step is just to consider a reframe, um, just to acknowledge that the reason we avoid conflict or anything in our life, we already said this earlier, is because we typically we haven't been getting good results and so we avoid it. But what if, what if you could learn a simple way that would create different and better results? Um, you know, could you reframe it? So I, I try, well, I heard some, uh, recently I heard this, it really, it really impacted me. Uh, it was a therapist saying that any relationship, both personal or professional, any relationship that does not have conflict on a pretty regular basis, some level of conflict isn't growing. It's not growing. And, and when she went on to explain that, she said, the, the, what I mean by that is if you're, let's say you're in a, a partnership or a, a personal partnership or marriage where you and your spouse just um, have different viewpoints, but you don't really discuss it anymore. So there is no conflict because you just don't enter into the discussion. Well, what happens with that siloed uh, relationship where those perspectives are in their own silos, you don't have conflict, but you don't have growth. You don't have exploration of another perspective or another point of view. And so the relationship isn't deepening because, you know, I'm a different person at 61 than I was at 31 or at 21 or 41. We grow. And as we grow, if we're still with the same people in our lives, we that's how we I don't you say thank goodness that I'm not the same person I was at 21. <laughs> it's so true in many ways, in many ways, most ways. In most ways. Um, yeah. So, so if you looked at conflict, imagine looking at conflict as a good thing, as a positive way to uh, deepen a relationship and to grow a relationship. What if we looked at conflict as I like to say, um, conflict is an opportunity for you to practice the skills. You can't practice these skills without That's conflict. True. You have to have it, to practice it. So it's a so it's a gift to you. It's a gift to the other parties because if you are learning or have already learned how to master these conversations, you get to be the shining example to others of how it could be. Uh, and then I think thirdly, it's a gift to the world. I think our world is hungry for leaders who can have a difference of opinion or perspective or viewpoints and somehow engage in those conversations with respect and non-judgment and, and have some, you know, explore some interesting productive ideas. So, so I think that's a, you know, it, if we reframe, if the first thing we do is try to reframe how we even feel about conflict, we're going to be in a much better position. To take some of the fire out of it, maybe? Yeah. If you, if you see it as an opportunity for your own growth and the growth of your relationship with this other, you know, people or people, um, then I think person or people, then I think you're, I think you've reframed it. Um, and you're right in your statement that, you know, you can't take someone to a place you haven't been. So part of what we'll talk about today are two frameworks, but the first one is an internal self-check. It has nothing to do with the actual words you're going to say or not say. It, it first is this sort of scan of where are you? Where are you in the in terms of this conflict, in terms of this subject, in terms of this person, in terms of this event, uh, 
Because if you can't get that, uh, if you can't get yourself on a stable, strong emotional platform, it won't matter what you say or how you say it. It won't matter. Well, a lot of conflicts yeah. evolve when people take things personally. And so from, mm -hmm. from what you're saying, if I'm thinking about this right, from what you're saying about reframing it, if I take out, if someone is attacking me verbally um, or saying something negative or is causing a conflict mm -hmm. um, and I quit taking it personally and I remove that part of it, um, which always seems to put the emotion into it is when we take it personally, right? Of course. Um, then I can then reframe it um, to use that as an opportunity to resolve it and move on, right? Or and in and, and to grow. grow, and to grow. It's an opportunity when you bless it. Like it's like if there's only two ways, really, typically that conflict happens, particularly in business. It's either you we're taking the conversation. You know, I'm bringing the conversation to Susan because I have an issue. There's something I need Susan to do differently, or stop doing, or start doing, or something. Uh, so I'm bringing the quote unquote conflict conversation to another person or the other person is bringing it to us um, so imagine if this conflict is marching down the hallway at you in the middle of your day in the middle of a dental office it's shaking its finger at you saying Susan I want to talk to you today before I go home because if that girl is here tomorrow I won't be I'm done with her right so it doesn't even have to be right. about you Ma managers do all the time and here this thing comes barging into their into their office they didn't see it coming they couldn't prepare for it and without a structure without a framework to count on you you don't have a choice but to react to that you'll just react to it and often we're we're scooped up in other people's emotion we're scooped up into their drama and their conflict um, instead of uh, being able to almost internally smile and say great internally to say, I'm glad for this. Let me, let me fold up my work here and let me take advantage of this opportunity to yet again practice my skills, to yet again demonstrate how this could look, uh, and to yet again turn this work back to them so they begin to learn these skills themselves. I'm, I, I'll tell you, Susan, when I, ask, when I ask owners and managers, what are the characteristics or what, what what characteristics would the perfect employee need to have? Like if you could just, if you could draw your perfect employee, what are the characteristics they have? And often they say things like they think for themselves. They know how to solve their own problems. They're, you know, they're critical thinkers. They're, um, they're, uh, they think outside their own needs and consider the needs of the team or the department or the business. Um, but they are self-starters. They are problem solvers. They are critical thinkers. So if we, if those are the qualities we're looking for, the greatest leaders and the managers will help to build those skills. Imagine how much work a manager could get done growing a practice if they did not have to spend 50% or more of their day solving these little minor issues that people right. run into. And if we teach that to yeah. others, well, we can't teach something we don't, if we're not modeling it, we can teach it all day long. But if, if we don't, if we aren't the example of it, they, they well, won't. And an, they won't another consideration, it. which is why this conversation is so important um, from my standpoint is that a lot of the uh, embezzlement cases of the practices that I've had has been in practices where the communication has not been so good, where the uh, one who was embezzling pitted the doctor against the employees and the employees against the doctor, um, becoming the middle yep. person and creating a conflict so much so that the um, person who was embezzling, everyone was afraid of them and uh, even the doctor. So mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. always interesting to me <laughs> when you go, okay, yeah. um, not sure why that lasts that long yeah. because they just don't want to, you know, move on. Sometimes they, I guess they think it's easier to deal, to tolerate um, being kind. Mm -hmm. 
I had a, I did have a doctor in the Northeast tell me I wasn't very merciful, but because I kept saying, you just need to um, go ahead and terminate her and find another employee that would be a better fit for that position. And apparently I was unkind because I said that, but it was interesting. But those are those would be tough well, conversations. They, uh, well, they are. well, they are. But I'll tell you, it's it's a it's an odd thing when you get so good at this that you actually in secretly internally enjoy it. Um, like if that person barged into my office, I I would say, oh, good, I get to play now. It's like a playground for me. Um, if I'm going to sit down, you know, if I'm in a, giving a speech and someone raises their hand and, and, you know, stands up in front of the whole audience and totally disagrees with what I love that I step into that because I see that I've had enough success with it that I trust my process and I trust myself and I enjoy the discourse and I know that the chances of me doing well with it are very, very high. And it gives me a chance to show to the entire room how this can be done. And for me, it's a fantastic opportunity. So just imagine if you did need to have a hard conversation like you just described, but instead of dreading, instead of losing sleep for nights before, you actually felt confident. And I think the most, the linchpin of this is that I don't feel I'm doing something to anyone. No, I, I remember going in that there are no victims here. They're not a victim. And I'm not, even though they may feel like a victim, I will, I will sometimes have to know it for them. Uh, they may not know it for themselves, but I know that I am no one's victim or no circumstances victim. And I am not uh, they, they are not either, even though they may feel like they are. So when you go in knowing that, you go in a completely different platform. And that's part of the self-scan that I'm going to talk to you about. So we can we can address that again in a minute. But it really is, I think the first step is knowing uh, or trying to reframe what conflict means to you and starting to look at it with a fresh set of eyes, that it's not a bad thing, that it absolutely can be a a welcome, good uh, opportunity to grow and to demonstrate uh, for for your family. Imagine teaching your children. Um, you know, I, I I tell the story that I grew up um, in a small town in Texas, and I had friends who their parents' uh, way of handling conflict was at the was at the one end of the scale where they was literally violent. You know, there there were they screamed and they threw things and they hit each other. And it was a very, a very, the way they handled conflict was violence uh, and intimidation. So there was, so there were those stories. And then I was on the other end of the spectrum completely. And I'm, I mean this literally, my parents never argued in front of me. I never heard my parents. Argue. Mm, wow. And so, it was a better way to grow up. I mean, it was a beautiful way to grow up. There was no, there was no conflict that I was ever exposed to in my family. But both ways are dysfunctional. Both ends of that scale are dysfunctional. So they, so they sent this young girl to college out into the world with absolutely no idea how the real world works. The first time I had a serious boyfriend and we had an argument, I thought, well, we're done, right? We, if we argue, we can't be together. And he was like, what the heck are you talking about? You know, we're just getting started. This actually means we might have a future, you know? And so, and so I had no context for how to do that. So both were unhealthy ways of dealing with it. And by the way, I came home from my break uh, at my first year at college and my parents announced they were getting <laughs> divorced. So somebody was arguing with somebody somewhere, um, but they hid it from me. And so, so neither way is, so I had to learn how to, uh, you know, to be successful in a marriage or in business or with friends or however um, that, you know, I had to learn how to do And so the, pretty. the reframing is only you, it only requires your only reframing. You. you can't make the other person mm -hmm. reframe. It's how you handle mm -hmm. it yourself. Then what's the second yep. step? You said that was the first step. That, that implies there's more well, than that's one. The, that's, 
Yeah, so, so so I would say the second step is this first framework that I'm going to give you. So now we have a different view of what conflict is. So now we're going to open up our arms and we're going to step toward it. We're not going to back away from it. We're going to step toward it, but not in an aggressive way. And the first thing I'm going to do, whether it's coming at me down the hall or whether I have asked Susan to come in and take a seat in my office because I want to have a conversation with her, right? So whether I'm bringing it to somebody or they're bringing it to me, I want to give you a four-step self-check. So the self-check has the acronym GECKO, like a little lizard, like a little Hawaiian lizard, GECKO, on your shoulder. I want you to imagine the cutest little one you can imagine, and they're on your shoulder. And the G stands for, we've actually already talked about it, this is a gift. I remind myself as Susan is storming down the hall at me and wanting to talk to me, I go, oh, okay, gecko. I got my little gecko on my shoulder. Gee, it's a gift. This Whatever Susan's bringing me is a gift to me. It's a gift to her and it's a gift to the world. So I'm embracing it. I bless it. The E stands for, I expect this to go well, no matter how it starts, no matter how it starts. It may start very contentiously. It may start very badly. But my expectation is that I will have the skill and the ability to redirect this, calm this down and reach a place. Or sometimes it starts with tears. You know, they're just tearful and they're, especially if you bring them into your office and they're scared about what this is, or they think they're getting fired or whatever it is, you may have tears, but whatever it is, I expect this to go well. And so my expectation is, I, I love the, one of my favorite quotes is I never lose. I either learn or I win. I either learn or I win. I either win this debate or I learn something that will help me in the next one. So I'm never losing, nor are they. Um, so that's the E. The C in Gecko, and I would tell your listeners, put a star by this one, circle this one, highlight it. Um, the C stands for choice. This is that piece we talked about, about the victimization mode. So I remind myself, no one is a victim. Everyone is what we call at choice. Everyone, every party to this conversation is at choice, even if they don't know it. I will know it for them. Because in America, at least at this, the, the listening of this recording, we are all free to choose where we work. We are free to choose who we retain as an employee. We are, I mean, nobody puts a gun to our head and says, you're going to put your keys in that car and you're going to drive to that job, whether you want to or not, or you're dead. Nobody. So no one has to work for us. No one, I, I, I often tell managers, take the words you have to out of your vocabulary. Nobody has to be at work at 730 on time, looking a certain way or acting a certain way. So when you acknowledge and respect that no, they do not have to do, this may not work for them. It, there are many cases where the kind of mother or the kind of father that they want to be prevents them from being on time at 730. The kind of parent they want to be to their children in the morning. And so they might have to be at work at 730 looking a certain way and being a certain way to work here. But they do not, they, they, they have full choice. And I want them to know I'm not sarcastic about that. I'm not being passive aggressive about it. I'm saying I truly respect that you have a choice and that you must make a choice that is good for your family, good for you, good for your career. And I respect and admire that you have a choice to make. I want you to know I've already made my choice. I need my employees to be here at 7.30 looking this way, acting this way, prepared in this way. I need my employees to show up at a meeting uh, and behave in this way. I need them to learn how to solve their own conflicts and not bring little petty conflicts to me. Um, those are expectations that I have, and I'm willing to help people learn those skills and to do it. But I have a non, they're non-negotiable. Uh, you don't own this business. You don't get to choose the rules. I do. And so, but my job is to make sure you're really clear about the choice that I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm always looking at my part of the conversation as I am not forcing anyone to do anything. I am inviting them into an opportunity. That's all I'm ever doing. 
I'm inviting them into an opportunity. It's the same with my grown children. It's the same with my spouse. It's the same with my neighbors. It's the same with my, you know, it, my, my colleagues. We all have lines of non-negotiability. Or we should. And those are our boundaries, right? Those are our, those are those are what make give give order to our life and create the life we want and the work we want. So once you become clear, then what you're doing is saying, my job, and Susan, I think this is the job of every leader and any communicator. We have we have to, I think we talked about this your last at our last uh, conversation. There's two things we have to accomplish. One is in a conversation is clarity and mm -hmm. inspiration. So we want people to leave a conversation with us, not confused. We want them to leave clearer than they entered the conversation, clear about what we're requesting, what we're, what's non-negotiable, what is negotiable. Um, we want to deliver clarity. And then we want to deliver inspiration around that clarity so that they're actually inspired to take a step toward it. You know, so that's what I'm doing with employees. I'm inviting them into the way we're going to do it here. And I've already made my my choice. Um, and so when you that frees you up, when you think this way and you really do honor this person's ability to choose, um, it's freeing. It's freeing for you. It's freeing for them. Often people don't know what to do with this. It's so much easier to blame the mean bad manager or the boss than to take responsibility that I now have to choose. I have to choose whether I'm willing to change my life to be here at 730 or whether I don't want to change my life. And that means looking for a new job. But I want to hand the work back to where it belongs. It belongs there. It's their choice. I've already made mine. Yeah, I love I love that you turned it around to make it a choice, not to say you have to. You don't have to. People don't have to wear a certain uniform. They don't have to they don't have to solve their own conflicts. There's plenty of places they could work that do not require that of them. Plenty. Right. There's plenty of places that'll start at 7 30. Um, so so all you're saying is eh, you know, my job is to make sure that you're clear what your choices are. You're clear that we want you and we are inviting you to into this opportunity. We think it's an amazing opportunity and we hope that you do. We will also 100% respect if you can't or won't, if you can't or won't. And we're happy to help you That's to awesome. find a place where it will work better. Yeah. But how yeah. freeing is that? Now I'm not angry. They have calmed down. Um, they may not like it. Uh, a lot of people don't like responsibility being handled, handed back to them. Uh, but, but it is the way we start to train critical thinkers, um, problem solvers, is we start reminding them that they never have been uh, anyone's victim. They just have thought they were, they, but they never were. They always had the ruby slippers on. They always had the choice. And so, uh, and so did we. And so did we. So I'm never really fired. I mean, it's very rare that I would actually have to find you. I think you work in some types of work where people do actually have to be fired. But most of the time in these uh, lighter level conversations that, that most managers and uh, owners and team leads are avoiding, um, we would rarely fire someone. They would maybe deselect. Right. They would maybe deselect, but but uh, we're giving them the opportunity to step in or not, um, with great respect. Awesome. There's a quote I, I wrote in my Monday morning stretch this morning. I wrote about my, one of my favorite quotes that said the the uh, a leader will emerge always as the person who can articulate reality without judgment, fear, or blame. The person who can articulate reality, like what are the facts here, um, without judgment, without blame, and without fear. Imagine that. So that's what that conversation is. That conversation is um, there are no victims and uh, we're going to state reality is this is the choice. And, um, you know, I'll give you to the end of the week or, you know, you have some, whatever's reasonable um, for them to decide how they want to proceed. But I'm totally treating them like an adult uh, in this, in this regard. It's just so powerful. 
So that's why I said put a star by this one. Because this one, remember, we haven't opened our mouth yet. This is me going, Gecko, whatever this is, is a gift. I expect it to go well, even if it doesn't start that way. I'm at choice and so are they. And the O stands for I remain open. I remain open to any any resolution that we might come to um, that makes sense for both. Yeah, and I would imagine that this last year with a lot of the kids being at home and just to pound off your 730 scenario, um, that a lot of uh, conversations along those lines have had to happen with uh, the yes. kiddos at home and kind of unplanned um, learning moments. That's right. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, well, and that's what the, that yeah. really speaks to the, to the O in Gecko. Uh, I'll give you a good example of that. We, um, had a client that, you know, we, we just do communications coaching and leadership coaching now, and this was an ongoing leadership client and they had a hygienist that had been a fantastic employee for years. She was, you know, had an incredible following patient following and they loved her and she loved them. And something had changed personally in her life, personally, that had caused her to now need to take her children clear across town to a school that they went to, where in the past she had not had to do this. She was struggling to get back for the morning meeting on time. And um, she actually was the one that initiated the conversation with the owner. She said, look, I, I just want to talk about this. I know I've been late several times the last few weeks. I want you to know that something's uh, changed personally in my life. And they talked about that a little bit. And she said, um, for at least the next few months, I'm going to have to do this. And I suspect I will, there will be more occasions where I may be late. And so I want to talk about it. And um, she said, I have a crazy idea and I'm wondering if you would be open to it. And so we, he had called me, the owner had called me and said, can you just help me with this conversation? Because this is what she's already told me. This is what she wants to talk about. So I said, well, let's just review Gecko. Let's review it. And as we got to the O, he said, well, I'll be open, but really, there's really only one answer here. She's either at work on time or she's not. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know what the, you know, if there are other options, but I'm just reminding you, just be open to any creative solution that would serve you both. So he calls me afterwards. He goes, well, I'm really glad you pounded that home because she did have a crazy idea. I said, well, what was it? He said, well, she said, you know, I've got my cell phone and they have a big monitor in their team room. And she said, I'm not, it, this is not going to happen every day and I'm on my way. So if I promised that before I leave work, I will, I will pre-check my charts for the next day and I will have those notes with me. Um, if I do that and I find that I'm in traffic and running late, for the next few months, could I log in on Zoom onto the monitor in the team room where you're having the meeting so that I've got my phone right on my dash on a holder? Um, I could listen live to the meeting and listen to what people are contributing. And I could also live contribute what I need to contribute about my patients for the day. And he said, well, you know, I, I never thought about that. And she said, once summer comes, I can change my kids' school. This is probably all going to be fixed. But until then, um, could we try this? And he said, well, you know what, let's run it by the team. Let's, tr let's experiment for a week or two. Let's see how it works. And, and we'll make a firm decision after that. And I said, well, there you go. There you go. That's someone who wants to make this work, who recognizes that it's an odd situation. And that's that whole piece of being open. It, it really, what we're speaking to there in the O and Gecko is losing our need to be right. Losing yeah. our need to be right. Human beings, all of us, myself included, we love to be right. It feels so satisfying and it often uh, creates a huge roadblock for a conversation to get through. When, we ha when our idea has to be the one that gets accepted, we have to be right. So that being open, opening up to some po other creative possibilities is huge. So that's the self-check. We haven't even opened our mouth. <laughs> And, and we've talked, we've kind of talked it to death, but it can be a really quick scan. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, that's you pretty know? amazing. I, I've been taking notes. <laughs> yeah, it's a great scan. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a little more to it, but it all comes back to, do we take personal responsibility? Um, can we be open? Uh, can we consider extraordinary possibilities? So, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, Susan, the the next step is to remember there's a couple of rules of engagement. And again, the interesting part of this is that 
the other person who hasn't taken this training won't know that these rules of engagement are at play, but you will. So the first rule of engagement that you just need to memorize is no talking backwards. And what I mean by that is if you've ever had a teenager or been in rela a deep relationship with a teenager, you know this cycle. We call it the spin cycle. Uh, and the spin cycle is, um, you know, you did this and I need it to stop um, or I need it to be different. And they say, I didn't do that. And you say, well, yes, you did. You, you did it yesterday. No, I didn't. I did not. Well, yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. You know, that's that's you. I need you to take out the trash more. It, you know, I know it's not on your job description, but I need you to back your teammates up. I always back my teammates up. Well, no, you don't. Because yesterday. Yes, I did. No. I did. So you can find yourself in that in work, that spin cycle. So I would ask that anybody who really wants to get better at this would recognize when they get caught into that spin cycle and get you get out. And the way you get out is you say, okay, well, going forward, I'd like to see if we could talk about creating a way that we could both know that this has happened or that all of our teammates would feel the same way about it as you do. Well, I, I, I didn't do it. Okay. But going forward, what I want to do is it's like redirecting a toddler. I don't mean that in a demeaning way. But what I mean is it's like someone, you know, how a, how a young child can get hyper-focused on one thing and we redirect them and they forget about it. And that's what will happen here. So we, they talk backwards. In other words, no two people, rarely will two people see the, see the past the same. We won't remember the past the same. We remember it differently because we're coming from two mm -hmm. different perspectives. So if you just accept that, and say, we're never going to see this the same. And I don't, it's fruitless to argue about it. Uh, every time they try to go backwards to the past, I'm going to redirect to the future. And I'm just going to say, okay, well, um, going forward, you know, looking forward, when we, when we think about the future, I'd like to talk today about how we could create a way where everyone could feel as confident as you do about that. Right. That's that's almost impossible to argue with. And it, re, it gets this out of that spin cycle. So rule number one, no talking backwards. Okay. Rule number two, listen first, talk second. You've heard this before. Listen first to understand, then to be understood. It's been said many different ways. What I mean by that is, so now we've done the gecko check. This person is sitting with us. We already reminded ourselves of the no talking backwards in case it shows up. And now I'm going to set the context, especially if I'm bringing, if I'm sitting down with Susan, I've invited you into my office and you have no idea what this is about. I'm going to say, well, Susan, um, thanks for giving me a few moments of your time. I wanted to talk to you today about um, how, how uh, you are participating or the level at which you're participating in our team meetings. So in other words, I'm going to set the context for the conversation, and then I'm going to listen. Then I'm going to say, and I have some requests or I have some ideas about how I'd like that to be different. But before we get into that, Susan, I'm interested to know, how do you think your level of participation is going? And how do, how do you view your level of participation right now in our team meetings, right? Or if I want to talk about what time they're getting to work, I might say, I want to talk to you about what time you're getting to work. And I have some requests around that that I want to talk about. But before I do, what do you, what do you think is happening? Or how do you think you're doing with, in terms of being here on time? Because whatever Susan says next is going to be helpful right. to me. So Susan's either going to say, and this happens more times than you think, Catherine, I am so glad that you called this meeting. It's been on my mind too. And matter of fact, I want to start out by apologizing. I know I'm supposed to be here, you know, or I know I should be, uh, I should not be rolling my eyes at the meeting. And, and I know that's really kind of a passive aggressive um, reaction and it's not helpful. And you know what? I'm sorry. And I'm going to stop it. Well, my whole conversation is going to be pretty short now, right? Cause they're already, they're already where I am. And, and so we're going to, we're going to have a great conversation. If Susan says, I have no idea what you're talking I'm about. I'm not late. I, 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 I'm never late. I, I'm always on time. Well, it doesn't matter. It's just, I just want to know where Susan is. Where is Susan right. in relation? And often, Susan, what happens is we learn something like the hygienist that has the short term issue. Right. And a good idea. And we learn that up front rather than we we give all of our 
dissertation. And then afterwards we learn her issue. Right. You know, now I'm not suggesting that just because someone has a personal issue means we're going to change our standard. I'm not suggesting that, but I am suggesting it's helpful to know. It's helpful to allow us to be empathetic, even though we may not change, we may not move our line an inch, but it is helpful to understand. Most people, even if you decide to part ways, they will part ways better if they feel understood. If you couldn't meet them where they were and you couldn't agree, as long as you were able to develop some relationship around empathy uh, and understanding, you will you will probably part ways fairly well. Um, and the only way that happens is by understanding. And so listen first, you know, set the context if you need to. And then the next thing before you're going to use the framework I'm getting ready to give you, the next thing is to check in with this person. Where are they in relation to this topic? It is so helpful. So helpful. Um, And then you can move in to this framework that we call ARCH. The acronym is ARCH, A-R-C-H. And I love the acronym because now this is how we're going to speak into this conflict. And I imagine it, I remember it as the bridge from the disconnect to the connection or from the conflict to the resolution. It's the bridge. It's the arch. So arch stands for the, the A, the A in arch stands for two things. The first is to affirm or acknowledge this person around this issue. And the second is to find a place of agreement within the issue. So affirming and acknowledging, first, I want to give a warning here. You are going to give a compliment or are going to give some affirmation, but you do not want this to be insincere because people will smell it a mile away. So when I say, Mm -hmm. you know, Susan, um, you know, you're one of the most professional employees I think we've ever had here, but I have got to tell you that the minute that if that, if, if that person has worked for me for a long time and they know, I don't feel that way, they know I don't think they're professional. They it, Then I have already basically blown yeah. the deal. Because this does not feel in integrity. It doesn't feel true. So I might have to say, you know, Susan, I, I want to talk to you about your level of professionalism, uh, that the level of professionalism that, that is displayed within the practice. Uh, and I have some very specific places that I'd like to, uh, to speak to around that issue. And then I check in with you. Uh, How would you describe your professionalism? How do you feel you're doing in that area? Uh, And so we listen to what Susan has to say about it. And then I'd say, well, you know, one of the things I want you to know is that even though I I want to talk about these these areas that that I have some concerns around, uh, one of the things I have no concern around is the uh, level of care that you internally feel and exhibit toward our patients. Um, You have a high level of integrity there. And I can't tell you how much I respect and appreciate that, right? If it's true, I gained, I just leapfrogged uh, the trust factor in this conversation. If it wasn't true, I just, I, I flew out the back door in terms of the trust factor. So do yourself a favor, make it true. Find something that is true that they would believe. Um, And it feels good to give that when it's really, really true. So give an affirmation if you can at all. It's a really great place to start. Also, just a heads up, eliminate the word but. (laughs) There there are times, you know, you're a writer, Susan, so you know. There are times where the word but is absolutely the right word in a sentence. It is rarely the right word in conflict. It is rarely the right word in conflict. The better word, of course, is and. But is like a wedge Mm -hmm. between this thought, the first thought, and the second thought. It drives a wedge between them and pushes them apart. Whereas and is like a magnet that pulls those together and makes it inclusive. This and that. We call it both and, right? It's, It's both this and this instead of it's this but not this. So... It's, it's inclusive. So when I say, Susan, I want you to know that I, you know, I so admire this piece about you. And I want to talk today about a couple pieces that I need to get better. Do you see how much better that is uh, for me to say, 
it's this and I want to talk about this rather than it's this, but I want to talk about this. But is like a big eraser. It's like a big eraser that just erased everything you just said right before it. So it's very hard. It sometimes still comes out of my mouth, but I am. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be careful it's because very, it it's the whole thing. first thing that you said, which might have been a compliment. And then you get in there and mm -hmm. people do it all the time and they don't even realize. I mean, we do it all the time. We don't realize what we've done. And so, yeah. yeah. And you ra if you raise awareness, you'll oh. hear yourself. Use, you'll hear, you'll already be out of your mouth. But that's the, of course, that's the first uh, step in change is, is awareness that you're even doing it. So just raise your awareness that you're using that word uh, and try to, sometimes I'll correct myself. Sometimes I'll say the word, but, and then I'll say, no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, I love this about you, Susan, and I want to talk about some other th some additional things, right? I, I'll correct myself because I want them to hear that I'm not right. erasing that uh, meant it, and um, and I want to include these other things. So connect it with and. So I move from affirmation to agreement. So I would say, Susan, I I want you to know I appreciate these things about you, and I'd like to talk about a couple of places I need to see some improvement. Um, would it be fair to say, Susan, that when the entire team is here at 7.30, ready to go. Lab coats are on. Coffee's already been consumed. We've all got our lipstick on and we are, we, our rooms are set up and we're ready to go at 7.30. That our days tend to go better. We tend to run more on time during the day. We tend to get our lunch more often when that happens. Would you agree with that? So a reasonable person is going to say, well, yes, of course, I agree with that. So look at what I've just done. I'm getting ready to tell them, Susan, I need you to do, I need you to get this straight or, or we're going to have another consequence. But before I do, I have affirmed them and I have, we have both of us now set, stepped on the same side of the fence. We are no longer adversaries across the fence playing this adversarial tug of war where we disagree. We're getting ready to get to the place we might not agree, but before we do, we're going to step onto the platform of agreement. So find something that if you said, you know, would you agree, Susan, that when we, when in a team meeting, we suspend our judgment and we clean slate the past and we come in with a positive, optimistic attitude and we ask good questions and we offer interesting solutions and we respect other people's position that we tend to have a better meeting. We tend to have a more productive meeting. Would that be fair to say? And if Susan shakes her head and says, yes, then I'm going to say me too. And so I would like to talk about two requests that I have for how you're showing up in those meetings that I think would contribute to us getting to that place. Do you see? We're stepping off from this platform of agreement. Now we're going to go to the disagreement. So the R stands for, basically it stands for resolution. It, it's the place where we're going to explore we're going to do one of uh, one of a couple of things. We're either going to explore ideas that the two of us have, or we're going, or I am going to, if I've initiated this conversation, I'm going to make a request. I'm going to clarify my position and what I need to be different. Um, and in this morning's, uh, in my my blog this morning, I uh, listed four reasons why people don't do what we want them to do. There's really only four reasons ever. One is they did not understand how important it was. They did not have clarity around the fact that it was expected and non-negotiable. And so that's on us, right? So I might say, if, if Susan says, I, I didn't realize this was all that, I didn't even realize you were watching me in the team meeting. Like I didn't even know. And I might say, then I just want to take responsibility for that, Susan. I want you to know that I should have made that much more clear. And I'm sorry if I didn't. And let me do that now. Let me do that now. Let me make this real clear now. Um, and, and I take full ownership. It is, I, I think I said this last time to you. I, I always, I, I mean it. I think vulnerability mm -hmm. and transparency from from a leadership standpoint, is sexy yeah. in a leader. It is. It is so appealing. It is, And I don't mean weakness, because that's not how I see it. I think a leader that says, well, you know what? If clarity is the issue, if you weren't sure what time, if you weren't sure 
or clear that 730, if they said, well, I just thought as long as we were here about a quarter till that was fine. And if I say, well, then I'm sorry if I ever did not make it clear how important it was to me personally that you're here at 730, not pulling into the parking lot, standing ready for the meeting. So I don't know what time you need to pull into the parking lot to be standing in our morning huddle at 7.30 looking like this. Uh, I'll leave that up to you, but it is a non-negotiable, highly important way to work here. Um, And I apologize how frustrating for you to be called into a conversation like this when I may have not made that clear. So can I, can I please just do that now so that you don't have any, any vagueness around it? So number one reason people or I should just say a reason people don't do what we want is they weren't as clear as we had hoped they were about the necessity. The second reason is they were clear, but they don't know how. So that often comes up. Like if someone comes in and says, I want you to talk to her because she's so mean to me. She's mean to me every day. And I just, I, you're my manager and I want you to fix it. Right. You, I want you to talk to her. So if the cultural standard, and it certainly is at Lions Speak and in my, in my business, I, I want, my team already knows that they don't bring me things like that because my expectation that I believe I've made very clear is that they have the tools to solve that. And I expect the only time it will ever cross my desk will be that they have tried several things we've identified already. They've already tried those and it hasn't worked. And now it's on my desk and now they need my help, which is, which is fine. But I never want them to come to me without having first tried these these frameworks. And because typically they always resolve it and it doesn't come to me. And so if that's a cultural expectation that you've built into your practice, but you didn't train people and give them coaching and practice on these skills, then of course they're not going to go solve their problem. So if I find that they are clear that that's the expectation, but they really don't know how, then I'll say, then let me help with that. You know, I'll be, I'm glad to give you uh, additional training, send you to a course, give you a book to read, let you listen to Susan Gunn's podcast, you know, (laughs) um, that, uh, you know, will, will help them. So they, they don't understand it's a requirement. They don't know how to do it. And then, and the next one is, I know it's important and I know how to do it, but I'm not capable. I'm either physically not capable I'm emotionally not capable or I'm intellectually not capable. And there certainly have been a few times where we have ascertained that someone does not have the IQ to pull this off or they don't have the emotional uh, stability to be able to do this. Um, That exists. Uh, We've even had some, we've had, uh, we had a a clinical person, uh, it was an associate doctor was very elderly and the pace at which we were running in that practice, uh, they were not physically capable of keeping mm-hmm. up the pace. And so it could be mm-hmm. one of those. The fourth one is I know that it's important. I know how to do it. I'm physically, emotionally, and intellectually capable of doing it. And I just don't do it. I don't want to do it. I refuse to do it, um, which is a willingness. We call that they're not willing. They're, they're, they're clear, they're trained, they're capable, they're unwilling. And I view that very lovingly. I say there absolutely will be some times where you don't agree. You don't think that practices should not take insurance. And you think that's not right. You don't agree. You don't think that's the way this practice should go. Um, and we want you to know we respect it and we honor it. And that would probably give us the information we need to, you know, know that this isn't a good fit. Um, This might not be a good fit for the two of us. So then we talk about how can we support them in getting to a place where they align a little better with the, with the direction. So if you keep that in mind in this R section of arch, that there's only four reasons why people don't do what we're wanting. You can start to identify, how can I help them? Can I make it clearer? Can I give them more training? Can we assess if they're even capable and get them off the hook if they're not? And can we bring it some, every now and then we bring it down to, they just don't agree and they're just not going to do it. And that, is just us helping them to transition someplace else. So um, it's a great way to look at it. And again, takes the personal piece out of it. Uh, So that's the R. 
Now you'll either bring an idea or a request or they will. And there are occasions where neither one of you know how to, you, you've identified the problem, but neither one of you know how to solve it. Uh, in that case, that's where we get a lot of clients. You know, people will reach out to a coach like us or, or some other third party resource uh, to help solve uh, and bring in some fresh ideas for how to solve this. So, but the R is where we look at requests and resolution and try to figure out what the, what the, what, what's the, what's the new thing we're going to do to, to create the resolution. And then Susan, if your audience could see me right now, I would get down on my knees and beg them that once they reach a resolution, not to quit, to remind themselves they're only halfway through arch most people are so excited they reached a resolution. They go, okay, well, that's great, Susan. Thanks so much for your time. I'm glad we solved that. And ba-bing, ba-boom, they're out of there. And then it doesn't go that way. And the reason it doesn't go that way is because they did not confirm and clarify the commitments that were made. What happens is there's more than two, there's more than one conversation going on here. Susan and I have a conversation verbally. But Susan has an internal conversation going on, and so do I. And when Susan is toggled into her internal conversation, she is missing pieces of the external one. So right about the time we said that Susan was going to do this, set up this uh, follow-up appointment next week on Friday, she was toggled out. And so, she, so we go away, and I think Susan heard what I said, but she didn't. And so then she doesn't get it done. Now we're back in here again, frustrated. So the best thing you could do for yourself is believe they probably, both of you probably did not hear every detail, especially in conflict, especially in conflict. I mean, how many times have you been in a conflicted conversation and in your mind, you're saying, what do they really mean by that? What do they really mean by that? What is she really after here? What is she saying? You know, and the whole time you're thinking that you're missing what's being said. So we all have that. So just know it's there, nothing you can do about it, but you can reconfirm. And if I can get Susan to give me the reconfirmation, it's even better. So sometimes I'll say, you know, sometimes Susan, I think I've been clear and reached a really clear agreement, but often I haven't reached it as well as I thought. So would you mind just repeating back to me what you think we just agreed to here and what we committed to? And that's where you'll see where the missing holes are and you'll be so glad you did it. Uh, and then lastly, the H stands for hope. Uh, wrap this thing up with a bow. Um, and the way I define it is I'm going to show gratitude. I'm going to say, Susan, I want you to know how grateful I am that you you were willing to sit down and talk this through. You got into this conversation and, and really, I'm just grateful for your contribution today. And I think of it as gratitude and as of um, hope for the future or optimism. And so I say, you know, I'm really optimistic about what we came up with. I think it's going to work. And I think based on our conversation today, that even if it doesn't work, uh, we'll come back together and we'll, we'll try something else, you know? So, so thank you. Um, I'm so appreciative of the time, you know, or the conversation, show them some love. It's hard to get to this point or it takes some effort. I don't know if it's hard, but it takes some effort, especially if it's new to someone, this practice, um, and I think it's a good time to show some gratitude and show some optimism for the new future you've just laid out. So uh, wrap it up with a with a pretty bow at the end. And that's it. So you can see, Susan, how if you do this little internal gecko check, you know that I'm not going to talk backwards and I'm going to always try to check in and listen first. And then I'm going to fall when it's my turn to talk. I'm going to follow this arch form. I'm going to start with affirmation and agreement. I'm going to move into resolution by making a request, clearing up uh, non-negotiables, um, looking at new ideas of resolution. Once we have it, I'm going to confirm the details and I'm going to leave it on this little, this little message of hopefulness and gratitude. It's a simple, simple form. But it, it's going and to require cannot... a lot of practice. It does. And, but you believe me, Life will hand you practice yeah, opportunities true, right? daily, yeah, daily, daily, daily. Try it with the neighbor. Try it with the stranger that, you know, their, their car door bumps into yours at the grocery store. There are lots of opportunities for little conflict moments that you can use this. Um, so, yeah. 
but it's been a f fail proof um, little system for us. And uh, it's, it's sometimes things can be simple, but surprisingly effective. I think if it's too hard, especially in conflict, if it's too hard to remember, you, you just won't do it because you're already right. ramped up with emotion. And so if we make this 10 steps, you're, you're just not going to, you're not going to do it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would love to offer your um, listeners a little cheat sheet. It's a poster that we've come up with. And on the left is Gecko and on the right is Arch and running along the bottom are the two rules of engagement. Awesome. I think putting that up in our bathrooms, in our, in our, um, you know, at home or, or in our office or in a team, you know, a team lunchroom or something where everybody can kind of look at it or go study it. If they're wanting to sit down with a colleague and have this conversation, they can do a refresher, but you're right, Susan, if you can create practice opportunities with your team, um, we have some practice scenarios that when we do workshops on this, we give people common scenarios that happen in dental practices and they can pick whichever one they want, but they get a partner and they both try to go through the scenario using this, um, th these frameworks. And it, and they'll often say, wow, it sounded really simple, but I got in there and, you know, it was a little harder than I thought. So, um, so, so it just, they it want a poster, practice. they need to contact you. Yes, email us. Uh, the email, best email would be info at lionspeak.net. So it's L I O N S P E A K dot net. I always say don't go to dot com because that's Lions Peak Winery. So go there no, if you want wine, no. but go if you want the poster, <laughs> come to lionspeak.net. Lions I don't know. I might go to the Lions Peak for. Uh, <laughs> go to both if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I will tell you, I wrote so many notes. This is the least I have ever spoken in a podcast. <laughs> Again, not my expertise, but I sure wrote a lot of notes. Um, you also mentioned your blog. Tell listeners how to get hold of your blog because it, their Monday morning motivations are amazing. And it never has um, ceased to fail me that I get a Monday motivation and it's something that I've been thinking about or toiling over and or something that just really speaks to my heart. So tell them how to sign up for those. Yeah, best way is just to go to the website, which is lionspeak.net. Uh, and you'll see blog as one of the tabs. Click on that and you can just sign up for free right there. It comes every Monday morning. Uh, it's called the Monday Morning Stretch. It comes into your inbox. You can share it with your team on to kick your week off. That's kind of how we dreamed it up. I have been riding that stretch for yeah, over 15 forever. years every week. Every week, yeah. So all the archives are there and uh, you can search by topic. Um, but come and join the conversation. Today's, today's created a lively conversation around it and uh, it was great. So uh, we love, we love, um, you know, we love just giving uh, dentistry, um, you know, all of us that work in, uh, you know, um, support roles in dentistry uh, and, and all the human beings that are represented in that world, uh, giving them a way to do it better. That's just what we're well. What and we on that line, stuff. you we talked in our conversation before we started recording. Um, we were talking about your upcoming book, so that's yes, pretty stinking yeah. exciting. It is. It is, and we've got some great stories um, in there about this, and examples, and you know. Um, and certainly the frameworks and all of that. We're very excited. Uh, we're, we're not writing it specifically for dentistry, though, as you can see, it applies, but really just to get it out into the world in any capacity. I met a, a woman who runs a, um, a small a medical clinic over the weekend at a, at a party. Uh, I sat next to her and she's new to the position as a manager. And she said, oh, these skills would be so helpful to me because the hardest part of my job is helping the people that are on my team to understand what they need to do and to do it well. And uh, I said, well, this will, this will help you for sure. So we're going to write a book so that it's easy for people to, or I am writing I'm in the middle of writing it. We hope to have it out well before the end of the year. 
Uh, and we also have a workshop. We have a workshop um, uh, coming up in May, May 18th to the 20th. It's called Courageous Conversations Workshop. So if you have a manager or you have a team leads or anyone on your team, whole teams come sometimes. Um, but definitely join us. Um, it, we have an early, uh, normally it's $7.99 uh, for those it's three mornings in a row, three, three hour blocks in a row. Uh, and, um, the, but the early bird, uh, is through the 20th, um, uh, April 20th. And it's six ninety nine if you do the early bird. And is that in California? So, Are you having those in California? Uh, it's in Pacific. So it's nine to 12 Pacific each morning. Uh, so it's a little later in the day for uh, other time zones. But uh, if you can spare a team member or two uh, to come, they can always bring the information back. And um, yeah, so we'd love to. But we really we really roll up our sleeves. They learn the framework, certainly. But a large portion of that time is spent in practicing these skills and having us. We put them into breakout rooms on Zoom. They practice and we drop into those rooms and help uh, to course correct and Awesome. It, so. The things that we do virtually yeah. now. <laughs> Crazy. It's just, it's been, it's yeah. been fantastic. And you were right in your introduction that when stress goes up, conflict generally follows in, in right behind it. Um, because our emotions are right. raw, you know, when we're under a long, a long time, we're under stress. And that has certainly happened over COVID. It has absolutely happened. And, and it's been stressed, not just in the practice from the ownership and management level, but from even the frontline level where people are managing, like you said, children at home. And, um, you know, the many people have parents who've been affected by COVID or, you know, just a lot on their minds of people whose spouses have been laid off from work and they're struggling to pay their bills. You, you add all that to the mix, you're going to have raw raw nerves, raw emotions, and people who get into conflict. And so having these skills hopefully will keep teams from sort of imploding and, and not doing well. So we're, we're anxious to get these out to the well, world. Well, oh my gosh. We so like, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the time going, okay, we went way <laughs> over and I didn't talk. I just wanted to point that out. Sorry, no, sorry about that. I have all these people that say, you talk so much. But anyways, oh. just to say... It was great. I didn't want to even curb that conversation at all because it's such mm -hmm. valuable information that's so needed right now just to, to try to wrap your head around the process and in yeah. such a valuable tool uh, to offer anybody, you know, again. Yeah, I think this time in our society, there's never been a better time to get good at this. Right, skill. no kidding. And I have a lot of listeners that are not in dentistry. Oh, and so, oh, good. Yeah. Well, it won't matter with this. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm looking yeah. forward. I will have all of the information that you gave as far as the blog okay. and the poster um, mm -hmm. on um, mm -hmm. the show notes so that they can review those. Great. And then um, if they want to reach out to you, you gave uh, an email address anyway. So they can, yeah, if you're absolutely. interested in the workshop, but that information is also um, online on your website. Yeah. yeah. So, absolutely. absolutely. And we're happy to have a conversation. If you just want to have a conversation about a particular issue, you can just book up what we call a pinpoint session uh, and say, here's my issue. I got to have this conversation. Can you help me through it? And you can just book a one-off, you know, just a pinpoint you know, 90 minute session, we'll get jump on zoom and we'll help awesome. you. So don't, you know, reach out for help, Be, you know, re, get a resource uh, that can help you. Through awesome. Yeah. That's valuable, right? That, that yeah. is really yeah. valuable. Yeah. Well, Catherine, thank you yeah. so much. I am so excited for so to welcome. get this thank information you. and I wish I could show everybody all the notes that I wrote down. Oh, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wrote so much, but um, uh, I just want to close by saying that Ronald Reagan was um, so well known for his peacemaking skills. And he mm -hmm. said, peace is not the absence of conflict. It's the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. And so, I, you know, if there's a takeaway, it's, it doesn't have to be adversarial and, but mm -hmm. It requires you to step aside to really listen to what the heart of the situation is. And so mm -hmm. um, 
I am so excited for you guys to have had this. And just to let you know, next coming up, the next time, I believe, is Janice. And we're going to talk about another in the embezzlement news case that's hit the headlines. And so those are always really fun conversations to have. Um, those are conflicts that have been resolved in other means. <laughs> other means. <laughs> and appropriate. And appropriate, appropriate means. means. Yeah. But anyways, um, thanks again, and you guys just take care and be safe out there. That's a wrap for this podcast of Money In, Money Out. Thanks for listening. Be sure to write down the most valuable tip you learned today so you don't forget it. And remember, you can find out more about all the valuable books and services Susan has to offer at www.susangunsolutions.com.